Good evening. My name is Heather Potter, and I'm the Curator of Photographs and Prints at the Filson Historical Society. Thank you for joining us virtually tonight for this program, All American Dogs, A History of Presidential Pets from Every Era by Andrew Hager. This program is in conjunction with our recent exhibition, Animals in the Archives, which is part of the Louisville Photo Biennial. The exhibit, it features uh, animal photos from the Filson's archives. The exhibit will uh, be open Monday to Friday, 9 to 4.30, and during regular business hours of Monday through Friday. So if you haven't uh, checked, out, checked out the exhibit, we hope you can. It does run through February. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker, Andrew Hager. Andrew serves as a historian in resident for the Presidential Pet Museum, a position he has held since 2017. Prior to that, he taught middle school, social studies, and language arts for a decade. Andrew is legally blind and travels with a black Labrador retriever named Sammy. He lives with his wife and their two children in the suburbs outside of Baltimore, Maryland. In addition to Sammy, the family has a fluffy mixed breed rescue named Emmy and two cats, Sophie and Olivia. Please enjoy tonight's program. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, and thank you, Heather, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so glad and so honored to be here speaking with you this evening um, as part of this series. Um, I, I hope that you learn a lot tonight, and I hope that uh, if you have some questions, please put them in the chat. I want to try and answer as much as I can. Um, we have some really fun stories to get to, and um, we'll see where we go. So I have a PowerPoint that uh, um, that I brought with me. Scott's going to put that up now, I believe. And um, let me just uh, give you a little bit about the museum while Scott's putting this up. Um, the, the Presidential Pet Museum is an online museum currently. Uh, we're looking for a permanent home. The, the pandemic kind of uh, messed us up a little bit, but we've been around since 1999 in one form or another. The current director and I both came in in 2017, and um, it's it's been a fun journey since then, learning the stories of all these presidential animals um, and kind of seeing what that tells us about America. And so... As we go through this tonight, I'm going to attempt to explain the history of America using presidential pets, or at least the history of American pet owning using presidential pets. Uh, so if we can see our, our first slide, um, uh, we're starting out with the most recent uh, pet to make a bunch of news, which is Joe Biden's commander. Now, uh, poor President Biden uh, has had some bad luck with his dogs. When he entered the White House, he had two. There was Champ, whom he had had since 2008 and had served with him through the vice presidency. Uh, and he also had a rescue dog, a rescue German shepherd named Major. And um, that was very exciting. We were all excited to see a rescue dog in the White House. Unfortunately, not too long into Biden's first year, Champ passed away and Major started biting people. So um, they tried training Major, it didn't work. I think one of the issues is that German Shepherds are kind of high strung and the White House is not a great place for a dog breed that's very protective of its owner. When you've got hundreds of people coming in and out all the time, strangers and aides and new secret service people, um, Major started biting, they tried to train him, it didn't work, they sent him away. Biden got Commander as a Christmas gift from his brother, another German Shepherd. Everybody was all excited. And now, about a year and a half later, um, Commander has been sent away because he was also biting people. So it's been a really tough time uh, for President Biden and his dogs. But we will come back to Biden uh, later in this presentation. Um, let, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, our next slide is George Washington and his hounds. Um, and it seems that one of my cats has stayed in the room. Oh, well, you might see a cat uh, in a little bit. So if we go back to the beginning of the American Republic and you look at the way that animals were a part of the fabric of the nation, 
it was generally as working animals. Um, George Washington had lots of dogs. He liked to go fox hunting. And um, actually, Washington is basically the creator or the father of the American foxhound. He had some British foxhounds that he didn't think were fast enough or strong enough. And his friend, the Marquis de Lafayette, sent him some French hounds that were far more aggressive. And Washington bred those to his American or to his English foxhounds and created the American foxhound. Um, there are still descendants of Washington's dogs out and about today. If you have an American foxhound, yes, you have a descendant of one of Washington's hounds. Um, obviously, in those days, because animals were generally working animals and they weren't they weren't quite so much considered um, members of the family at that time, we didn't get a lot of press information about Washington's dogs. We find stuff in his uh, letters. We find stuff in instructions to people at the plantation, but we don't know a lot about them. They had some interesting names. There was uh, there was Traveler, and there was Tipsy, and there was Drunkard. Um, there were other names too, but those are the ones that stick out in my mind. I, I don't know what Drunkard's issue was. Uh, maybe he was hogging the water bowl. Hard to say. Um, so Washington, father of our country, father of the American foxhound, but here's our first unfortunate point where we have to acknowledge um, sort of the, uh, the underbelly of things. As with almost everything else connected to our nation's founding, slavery kind of works its ugly way in here. Washington loved his dogs, but he did not like for his slaves to have dogs because he believed that the slave dogs were killing the sheep, the livestock on the, on the plantation in Mount Vernon. Um, and sometimes those slow those slave dogs, which were of mixed origin and not purebred dogs, would breed with his dogs, which he also didn't like. Um, if he found that a mixed breed dog had bred with one of his hounds, he would have those puppies drowned. And if he caught the slaves with dogs of their own, the, the dogs would be hanged as a lesson to the slaves and the slaves would be punished. We don't know what those punishments were. It just says in his letter to his overseer, make sure they are punished appropriately. Um, this is really horrific. And it's, it's an example of just as we don't think of dogs and cats and all of the animals around us as primarily working animals anymore, we also wouldn't countenance this kind of thing, but it wouldn't have been out of place in the 1780s and 1790s. Um, uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, James Madison also had the dogs on their plantations killed if, if they found slaves with dogs. So, uh, you know, um, it, it's tough to look at our heroes and, and to see their shortcomings, but that's that's America and that's kind of where we have to start. Now, after Washington, we go through a long period where there aren't as many presidential pets. Everybody has horses, of course. Thomas Jefferson had a singing mockingbird. Uh, we believe it was trained to sing opera because of the price he paid for it. Um, that was a thing that rich people could do back in those days. Um, you know, you didn't have you didn't have an iPhone that could just play music off of Spotify. So if you wanted to hear music, having a little opera trained bird around to uh, whistle the magic flute might be great. Um, but the next presidential pet we're gonna focus on really is on our next slide. And that would be Abraham Lincoln's dog, Fido. What you're seeing is actually the first known picture or photograph of a presidential pet. Now, Fido did not go with Lincoln to the White House in D.C. Um, he lived with the family in the late 1850s in Springfield. When Lincoln was nominated for president and when he won the election, it became very obvious that Fido was too anxious to go to D.C. You know, people would come by the house. They were uh, there were like fireworks set off outside the house, which many of your dogs might also not like. Um, you know, there were cannon salutes and all kinds of things. And Fido just, the family knew that wasn't going to work out. So Lincoln it gave Fido to some friends of his, uh, local, local neighbors. And he said, hey, will you take care of our dog till I come back at the end of my term? They said, sure. Now, Lincoln, uh, among his many virtues, Lincoln loved animals and small children. And he basically treated them about the same. His kids didn't have a lot of rules and his animals didn't have a lot of rules. 
Uh, Lincoln made the neighbor who took Fido in promise that they would not punish the dog for bringing mud into the house and that they would allow the dog to climb on their furniture and the dog could come and go as he pleased. And that all worked out fairly well for a while. Um, when Lincoln was assassinated in 1865, uh, the, the funeral procession stopped outside of his old home and Fido was there with the new owners. Um, so Fido was part of Lincoln's funeral. They believe that uh, these photographs were taken um, as part of a souvenir uh, sale uh, for Lincoln because after Lincoln's assassination, he, people just wanted keepsakes and, and mementos of Lincoln, especially around Springfield. So photos of Lincoln's dog would have been sold at that time. And that's why we have Fido here. Now, the, the unfortunate ending of Fido um, is that a couple of years after the assassination, Fido was still operating by the same rules that Lincoln had laid down. He, he could come and go as he pleased. He didn't have to worry about getting his paws cleaned. He could jump up when he wanted. And he made the mistake one day of jumping up on a man who was known as the town drunk. He got the guy muddy and the man stabbed Fido and Fido retreated to the local cemetery where he was found dead the next day. Um, kind of a tragic story that Fido, like his owner, was assassinated. Um, that's pretty heavy. Um, but uh, we do salute Fido for being a trailblazer in terms of presidential pets and their um, and their visibility. Uh, I promise not all of my stories will end with animals being deceased. So um, you know, take heart, take heart. Uh, let's see our next slide here. Old Ike. Old Ike is one of my favorite animals. So we start off with Washington and you kind of have this working animal. And as we get to Lincoln, animals start to become a little bit more of a pet, but not quite as domesticated or as trained as we have them today. Around the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, you start to see a lot of unusual animals at the White House. And this is a time in America when people started to keep unusual pets. Um, you know, I've read stories about people going door to door and selling monkeys in the early part of the 20th century. Um, if you can imagine that, I thought the people selling vinyl siding were annoying. Imagine somebody showing up and offering you a monkey. Um, but Old Ike is one of my favorite presidential pets. He kind of represents that weird pet. Uh, but there's a very specific story here. Uh, when the United States entered the war, World War I in 1917, Woodrow Wilson um, wanted to be an example to the American people. He knew there were going to have to be sacrifices, that people were going to have to tighten their belts. And one way that he decided to do this was to lay off the White House groundskeeping staff, or at least a number of them. The idea was that these men could then go and volunteer for the war in Europe. I'm sure they would have rather stayed at the White House, but um, he said, no, 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 this is good. Go off to the war and I will replace you with a herd of sheep. So he brought in uh, 20 sheep, one of which was a ram, and that ram was Old Ike. Uh, one of the things I like about Old Ike is that um, he developed the habit of chewing tobacco, which is very unusual for rams. But at that time, again, thinking about the time, thinking about the fact that almost everyone in those days would have been a smoker, or, or at least almost every man in those days would have been a smoker, you have all of these politicians and um, press people coming by the White House. They're going to see the president speak. They just throw their tobacco on the ground because we also weren't as conscious about littering in the early 20th century. And who's going to come along and eat the cigar butts that are left on the ground? Well, it's old Ike the Ram. And he got to enjoy the cigar butts so much that if he saw you on the White House grounds taking a cigar out of your pocket, he would approach you and he would nudge you. And if you didn't give him a cigar to chew on, he would become more aggressive. Um, and, you know, I don't know how many of you have a lot of experience with rams. I know that I don't. But my understanding is that having a ram angry at you would be worse than having one of Biden's dogs angry at you. So most people gave up the tobacco and old Ike continued to chew it. Now, when the war ended and Wil Wilson's term ended, Ike went to a, a farm in northern Virginia and um, as his last act, as he lay dying, uh, the farmer gave Ike a cigar to chew on. So Ike got to go out happy. Um, so good for him. 
the other interesting thing about Ike before we move on is just that they had an auction during the war to sell off the wool from the sheep on the White House, and the money went to benefit the American Red Cross. Ike's wool sold for $10,000 a pound. And that's $10,000 in 1918 or 1919 money. Um, so quite a lot of money. Still holds a record for the most expensive wool that has ever been sold. So, um, you know, thank you for helping out the Red Cross, Ike. That was very nice. Uh, our next slide. Back to a more traditional animal. Um, we get into the 1920s and we start to see the rise of celebrity presidential pets. Um, you can see it with Warren Harding and his dog Laddie Boy. Uh, there's a Laddie Boy statue at the Smithsonian that's made out of um, that's made out of pennies collected by newsboys after Harding died. Uh, Laddie Boy got a lot of uh, press, but what you're seeing now is the only official White House portrait that features a presidential pet, and I think. Uh, this is the most beautiful White House portrait that has ever been created. Uh, Jackie Kennedy agreed with me. This was her favorite portrait. So you've got Grace Coolidge here wearing a red dress with a white dog standing in front of a blue background. Very patriotic. And you might ask yourself, well, how did Mrs. Coolidge uh, keep that dog in that spot uh, for a couple of hours? You know, because when you sit for a painting, you're there for a while. Well, the trick was that she was giving the dog treats constantly. And if you look at the picture, the dog is kind of looking up at her like, hey, where's my next biscuit? You know? So you, <laughs> this is one of the things I love about presidential animals. Um, I can see that happening with me. It's very relatable. It, me trying to keep my dog quiet and still for something. It's great to see these historical figures having to do the same kinds of things that the rest of us do with our animals. And I am really grateful that Grace Coolidge had this beautiful painting made. And um, Rob Roy and uh, his sister Prudence Prim, these white collies became synonymous with the Coolidge family. Um, you know, so it, they really were very, very famous. Now the Coolidges had over 20 animals at the White House. They, they were not the record holders. The record holder was Teddy Roosevelt. Um, I don't have a lot of good pictures for Teddy Roosevelt's animals, so I, I didn't bring them in. I can talk about that more during Q&A if that comes up. But the, the Coolidge's didn't just have dogs and cats and things that we would today consider a normal pet. They also had, uh, on our next slide, Rebecca the raccoon. Now, why would you have a pet raccoon? It, it sounds like a way to get rabies. Um, but for the Coolidge's, they were such animal lovers that when they received this weird package, they had to keep her. Um, what happened was a supporter in Mississippi decided that he wanted to send the president a Thanksgiving dinner. So he sent the president a live raccoon with the understanding that the president or his staff would kill the raccoon and cook it for Thanksgiving dinner. In those days, you didn't have as much refrigeration, um, you didn't have airplane travel, so you really had to send a live animal because otherwise it might get might go bad before it got from Mississippi to D.C. So the Coolidge's get this box and there's a raccoon inside and they just thought she was cute. They, they couldn't even dream of eating her. So they got her a little um, jeweled collar that said White House Raccoon, and they built her a tree house in a tree outside of the Oval Office so that Coolidge could look out and see his pet raccoon in the tree while he worked. They brought Rebecca to the White House Easter egg roll one year. That didn't go so well because, as you can imagine, like a bunch of kids running around and then there's just this raccoon in the mix. Um Rebecca ended up tearing somebody's stockings and got removed. She never went back to the White House Easter egg roll. Um, the Coolidge's were so fond of Rebecca that they decided, hey, she should probably get a buddy. Let's get her a boyfriend. And they brought in a male raccoon named Reuben to join Rebecca. But Rebecca was happy being a single lady, and she started to run away after Reuben arrived. They would send the Secret Service out into Washington, D.C. to find Rebecca. And I don't know what that looks like. I can't imagine being a Secret Service agent and just being tasked with somewhere in this city is my raccoon. Go find my raccoon. I mean, I'm sure the caller was helpful, right? But uh, it sounds like a terrible job. Anyway, eventually Rebecca was uh, given to a local park and she went back to a, a wilder and uh, less politically involved life. But fortunate for her, Ruben didn't go with her. So she, um, you know, she got to 
live how she wanted to live. So yay, Rebecca. Um, our next slide shows arguably the most famous presidential pet of all time, and that would be FDR's dog, Fala. Fala slept on a chair at the foot of FDR's bed every morning when the president's breakfast arrived on a little tray. Uh, there was a little dish on the tray with a biscuit for Fala. Fala went to all kinds of places. Um, you know, he was at the Quebec conference uh, where uh, Churchill and FDR discussed the Manhattan Project. Um, there was even a story that um, became a minor campaign issue in 1944 that FDR had taken Fala on a trip to the Aleutian Islands to visit a mi military installation. And that the story went that after the president boarded a battleship or a destroyer to head back to the mainland, they had sailed for quite some distance when it was realized that the dog was left behind and they had to turn the battleship or destroyer around at a cost of several millions of dollars and at a risk to the lives of the entire crew to go get the dog uh, back at the dock. Now, um, this story was spreading in uh, the late summer of 1944. And in his first speech of the 1944 campaign, which believe it or not happened in September, imagine a world where the presidential campaign doesn't really start until September of the election year. I mean, it sounds kind of like paradise. Um, but anyway, at this speech, uh, FDR brought up the accusations related to Fala um, and with a little bit of uh, help from Orson Welles who helped him work on the speech, he went into a routine about how he expected to be attacked and how his wife and children were, you know, accepted the attacks against them by the political opposition, but that Fala just couldn't stand it. And he was bruised down to his little scotch soul. And he went on and, and kind of made fun of these rumors for a couple of minutes in his speech. And it was a big hit. Even Republicans who listened to the speech thought that he was funny and the Fala story went away. There's no evidence that it ever actually happened, um, but it's a good example of political jujitsu uh, where the where FDR took this story that could have been uh, damaging to him and he turned it into something that was a strength. Uh, that happened again with Richard Nixon and his dog Checkers, who is technically not a White House dog because Nixon was running for the vice presidency at the time. Uh, he was going to be, uh, he was really close to being kicked off the campaign for accepting donations. In fact, uh, Dwight Eisenhower thought that Nixon was giving the speech to resign. But instead, Nixon laid out his financial uh, situation, explained that, you know, he hadn't done anything illegal. And then he said, there is one gift that we're going to keep. My kids love this dog and we're going to keep her. Uh, and he was talking about checkers. Um, and that was a big moment. People in America were really excited about uh, checkers and Nixon. And suddenly there was overwhelming support to keep him on the ticket. He basically rescued Nixon's political career. Um, so whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, I, I will leave to other historians. But it's a very interesting moment where, as with Fala, Nixon used political jujitsu. And I'm sure that he got a little kick out of taking this FDR democratic te technique and using it for his own purposes. Um, our next slide is actually from, uh, Push uh, from President Kennedy's White House, Pushinka. Um, Kennedy had a lot of animals. He was allergic to most of them, but he felt that his kids should grow up around animals. Uh, so they had a cat named Tom Kitten. They had a, a Welsh terrier named Charlie that was Kennedy's favorite. They would go swimming together in the White House pool. But my favorite of all the Kennedy animals, um, horses, dogs, cats, parakeets, uh, my favorite is Pushinka for a few reasons. First of all, uh, Pushinka's mom had been to outer space. Uh, the Russians in the early 1960s, at the time that uh, Kennedy became president, were ahead of us in the space race. You will remember that they launched Sputnik in 1957. Um, in early 1961, uh, Yuri Gagarin uh, went up and did a few orbits of the Earth. We didn't send up Alan Shepard until a few months later, and he didn't even do an orbit. He just kind of did a suborbital thing, uh, more similar to what uh, Elon Musk and uh, Richard Branson have done recently. 
So we were behind in the space race, and the Russians had actually sent dogs up into space and brought them back. Now, the very first dog in space was named Laika. They sent Laika up there with no intention of bringing the dog back. They just monitored to see what would happen and how soon the dog would die, which is really terrible. But there were two dogs, Belka and Strelka, who were strays taken from the streets of the city near where uh, the Russians were launching all of these spacecraft. And they sent Belka and Strelka into space. They brought them back safely. Strelka got pregnant and she had puppies. Now, June 1961, John F. Kennedy meets Nikita Khrushchev in Vienna, Austria to have a summit. They're talking about the Cuban Missile, uh, not the Cuban Missile Crisis. They're talking about the Bay of Pigs. They are talking about Berlin. They're talking about all of these hot button issues. And it's Kennedy's first major moment on the international stage. And Khrushchev is kind of running circles around him. He's been around a while at this point. And Kennedy's new. He's not quite ready for it. But at dinner, uh, at the dinners every night, they would have these big state dinners. And Jackie Kennedy was seated next to Nikita Khrushchev. And so Khrushchev is trying to brag a little bit about the space program. And he says, uh, you know, we sent these dogs up and uh, we brought them back. And one of the dogs has had puppies. And Jackie Kennedy doing that thing that uh, we sometimes do to deflect when it, you know, she said, oh, well, you certainly must send me one of those puppies. You know, the kind of thing where if somebody tells you I have a beach house, you might say like, oh, you have to have me to the beach. But you both know that you're never going to go to the beach. Except that in this case, Jackie Kennedy forgot about it. And then a few weeks later, Khrushchev did not forget about it. And a little puppy showed up at the White House with a Russian passport saying her name was Pushinka. Uh, Pushinka is the Russian word for fluffy. So they get this dog. And of course, the first thing that has to happen is that the FBI and the Secret Service have to examine the dog. Did the Soviets put poison on the dog's fur so that Kennedy will fall over dead if he pets the dog? Are there hidden listening devices uh, buried in the dog? Is there a bomb inside the dog? I, I don't know how they check for all of these things. Poor Pushinka must have gone through quite a lot, but it was determined that she was fine uh, and they gave her to the family. Kennedy wrote a nice thank you letter uh, to Khrushchev and he sent him back a ship in a bottle, which is not as good a present as a dog. Um, but, you know, at least it's something, right? Uh, in 1962, in October, that same back channel exchange of gifts passage that they had enabled Kennedy and Khrushchev to continue to communicate, um, you know, while the world was on the brink of nuclear war. And there are some historians who suggest that this back channel exchange of gifts really allowed these men to step back because it's hard to look at someone who sent your kids a dog and think, you know, what an evil person. I should totally drop a nuclear bomb on them and annihilate their whole civilization. You know, you tend to pull back a little bit from that if, you know, the dog's running around playing with Caroline and John over on the rug. So the the Americans and the Russians were able to come to an agreement. They were able to back down. I'm not saying Pushinka is entirely responsible for the uh, salvation of all humanity in October of 1962. She's just one piece but I think that's a pretty cool uh, little moment there where a dog gets to be, um, you know, at least, a, you know, one straw on that pile of things that brought the situation to an end. Um, Pushinka then went on to have puppies with Charlie, Kennedy's uh, terrier. And a couple of those puppies were given to kids in the Midwest in late 1963. Um so there might still be some Pushinka and Charlie descendants out there. Hard to say. Uh, I keep hoping that someone will eventually tell me they have one. But uh, with all the press I've done, I haven't found anybody yet. Uh, but I love Pushinka for all of those little interesting things about her. Our next slide is Socks the Cat. Now, um, Socks was the, the cat that belonged to Bill and Hillary and Chelsea Clinton when he entered the White House in 1993. Socks was the only pet that they had uh, for a number of years. Eventually, the Clintons did get a Labrador named Buddy. Socks and Buddy famously did not get along. Um, Bill Clinton said that he had a, an easier time uh, negotiating peace between the Israelis and Palestinians than he did between Socks and Buddy. Um, so it's uh, 
it, it was pretty rough there. In fact, there was a press conference where Buddy was brought out and he's sitting next to the president. And then the cat walks in the room, the dog starts growling and the cat's hissing. And, you know, the, the White House didn't really have a chance to uh, manage the situation very well because it just, you know, animal kerfuffle in the middle of a press briefing. Uh, but Sox was really popular. Buddy never really caught on, but Sox was, you know, in all kinds of political cartoons, uh, Sox was on shirts. We have a shirt at the Presidential Pet Museum with a cartoon of Sox saying, I, I didn't inhale, um, you know, all kinds of things like that. There was even a, a Super Nintendo game that was in development. It was never finished, but it was called Sox Rocks the Hill. And I guess, you know, you would jump on bills to veto them. I, I'm not sure why the cat had the veto power. Um, I haven't played this game. I would love to hear more about it if someone has. Uh, I like to imagine that the final boss battle is against Newt Gingrich, um, but that, that remains unverified. Um, so we have socks, and, you know, I get a question fairly often, why are there so many presidential dogs, but you don't have a lot of presidential cats? And I think one of the reasons is that cats aren't as manipulative, or, or you can't manipulate them um, for a photo opportunity as easily as you can a dog. You know, you can't just sit there for two hours feeding your cat treats and expect the cat to sit in the same place like you would with a dog. Um, you, if you bring the cat out for the press, the cat's just going to wander off. Socks was a very friendly cat, and, and this was not a staged photo. Uh, you know, Socks just climbed up there. But, uh, you know, most cats aren't like that. Um, so you kind of end up with cats being in the background. But that that sort of brings us back to... Uh, Joe Biden. So if we can see the next slide. This is Willow. This is Joe Biden's cat. We don't know very much about Willow. We know that Willow met uh, the first lady at a campaign event in, uh, you know, in 2020 in, in Pennsylvania. The cat just came on stage and started rubbing Dr. Biden's leg. And they waited about a year to bring the cat into the White House. They were trying to get the dog settled down first. So the cat was living with another family. Eventually when Major left and they got Commander, they thought, well, now we can bring Willow. They brought Willow to the White House. My point with all of this being that, you know, maybe more presidents should have cats. If cats cause trouble, uh, you know, it's usually the kind of thing that's sort of off off camera somewhere maybe it's scratching some antique furniture um but they're not uh, they're not biting secret service agents they're not uh, um, teddy roosevelt had a bull terrier named pete who chased the french ambassador and, and chased a naval attache up a tree um fdr had a german shepherd named major who tore the pants off of the british ambassador in 1933 again these are the dogs and then you've got the cats now uh, I'm a dog person because I have a guide dog, uh, but I can really see the advantages politically of cats. Um, and, you know, people used to ask me when Trump was president and he didn't have an animal, what kind of animal he should get. And I always said like fish, because Trump doesn't like germs. You know, he wouldn't have to touch the fish. They're very beautiful. You could have a wonderful tank there. A lot of hotels do. He, he would know that. Um, but I think for most presidents from now on, I'm going to recommend the cat. So Willow are currently currently the only presidential pet at the White House. Um, you know, just stay in the background, keep uh, being a good kitty, and uh, you know we won't have to <laughs> hear any terrible stories about Willow being rehomed. Um, that's that's my last uh, slide with a photo. The next slide has my content or my contact info and the website for the museum. Um, you're welcome to email me questions after the um, after the talk. I've gone through this pretty quickly, but I was trying to make sure that I saved some time to answer questions because, you know, there are 46 presidents and I'm not going to be able to be thorough with one minute per president. <laughs> so, um, you know, we'll see where where the people want to go with this. And uh, I guess that means we're bringing back Heather. Yes. Thank you so much. That was super fascinating. I learned a lot about the different presidential pets um, and am thinking I should get your uh, book for Christmas gifts because I think I have some family members that would enjoy it. 
Um, so I do think we're putting a link in the chat for people who are interested in the book. Um, and then we also have a handful of questions that we received. Uh, so the first question, um, we had somebody very interested and wants to know more about uh, Teddy Roosevelt's pets. Okay, so Teddy Roosevelt, I mean, if you count all of the animals that he had between the White House and Sagamore Hill, we're talking over 40. Um, wow. There were a lot of dogs. Uh, he had a Chesapeake Bay retriever named Sailor Boy, who, unlike my dog, didn't mind loud explosive noises. There, Teddy Roosevelt wrote a letter that, you know, his kids were playing with firecrackers and fireworks, and the dog was just right there with all of them, even though it was very dangerous. And I have questions as a 21st century parent, but again, it was a different time. I guess you just gave the kids fireworks and said, go play with this and the dog down, down in the yard. Um, Teddy also had a number of horses. Uh, of course, he loved riding horses, and we were right at the transition into automobiles at that time. He had some flying squirrels. He had a one-legged rooster. He had a badger named Josiah. Now, this is this is a great little anecdote that he stopped at a a whistle stop uh, campaign place in uh, in Kansas somewhere. He's on the back of a train, you know, speaking there. And this little girl approaches him with a badger and offers him the badger. Now, I'm not sure. I, I know that in those days, maybe the Secret Service wasn't as involved as they are now. I'm not sure how you get to walk up to the president with a live badger. I'm not sure why this little girl's parents are letting her walk around with a live badger. And I'm well, I mean, I kind of do know why Teddy Roosevelt accepted it. Teddy thought of himself as a naturalist. Uh, he'd been uh, studying animals informally and formally his entire life. When he was a little kid, he would taxidermy animals in his family home until the maid complained. Um, you know, when he was seven or eight, you know, he'd just go out and bring back dead animals and try to stuff them. Um, you know, so Teddy loved animals. And he wrote a letter home to one of his sons saying like, oh, I just got the most amazing badger and it bit me. You know, like, isn't this grand? Um, I would be like, I got a badger, it bit me, so I put it off the train and it's back in the wild now. <laughs> but they built a little home for it at the White House. It, it did eventually prove to be too destructive and, and was sent to a park. Um, but I love Josiah. Um, there's also a really great story uh, about one of Teddy Roosevelt's kids. I think it was Quentin going to the local pet store and he buys a bag full of snakes. He brings back like five snakes. Dad's in a cabinet meeting. You hear this in a couple of different varieties. One is that it's a cabinet meeting. Another is that he's meeting with some senators. The important thing is that Teddy Roosevelt is meeting with some important political figures. The kid runs in the room, dumps the bag of snakes on the table in front of all these guys, and they immediately leave. Everybody in the room leaves except for the kid and Teddy. And the two of them put the snakes back in the bag. And then as a punishment, he has to take the snakes back and get a refund at the store. You know, you can't keep the snakes. You disrupted the cabinet meeting. Uh, but I, I love that. Like, it just, it sounds like the way Lincoln would have raised kids, you know, like Teddy Roosevelt and Lincoln were very much of the same uh, kind of freewheeling, go have fun, life is rough and tumble uh, kind of uh, parenting philosophy. So I, I love the story about the uh, the snakes. And so Teddy's got a lot of stuff going on. Um, he's He's very interesting that way. That is so funny. Well, to kind of um, segue into another question, how did you um, research? Can you tell us a little bit more about how you learned about all these stories and the research you did um, for an example, like the Rebecca the Raccoon story? How are you unearthing these stories for your book? Well, so the good the good thing about coming into uh, to be the historian at a museum when the museum is already almost uh, 20 years old is that a lot of the stories have been collected for you. Now, one of the things I found when I was researching my book is that not everything that uh, the museum had on its website was necessarily accurate or that there were discrepancies. Um, for my book specifically, I was doing a lot of research during the pandemic, and so it was a lot of online research. Uh, one of the most helpful things you can do if you're interested in presidential pets uh, or the presidents in general is to contact the presidential library and ask questions. They will dig up all kinds of articles and send them to you. So like, for example, with Pushinka, I contacted the JFK library in Boston. I asked questions about Pushinka. They sent me back like this entire oral history of Pushinka, or it was like exit interviews by these different um, members of the Kennedy staff talking about Pushinka, you know, and, and what their role was. So there are these, you know, 
Um, unlike with our families and our homes where we take care of the dogs all the time uh, or take care of the pets all the time, at the White House, you have people who do that for you. Um, in the Kennedy era, it was a guy named Travis Bryant, and he had he wrote a book called Dog Days at the White House, uh, where he kind of covered everything that had happened from the Eisenhower era up through the early Nixon years in terms of pets. And he also included some gossip about Kennedy's affairs and things like that in there. So there are books like that out there. With Rebecca, um, it was finding things more um, in newspaper archives and, and things like that. There wasn't quite as much. And it gets harder as you go back because, um, as I was alluding to during the presentation, when pets weren't considered part of the family, when they were just animals that were around the house and they were sleeping outside, they would occasionally be mentioned in diaries or letters, but they weren't really covered by the press in the way that, say, commanders' biting incidents have been covered by the press. You don't really see a lot of that stuff until the 1920s. So it gets harder to find the information as you go back. But it, it is there in lots of different sources. Interesting. So another question we received is what is, and this was one of my questions I had for you as well, what is the most unusual animal any pre, uh, any president has ever had? And all the presidents you've researched, what was the craziest one besides the raccoon, which to me was pretty wild? Yeah, the raccoon and the badger are wild. I think old Ike is wild, although the, the chewing tobacco is like the icing on the cake there. I mean, that's the part that really makes that story extra uh, funny. Benjamin Harrison had opossums. Um, I don't even know what you do with a pet opossum. And, and he named them like uh, Mr. Reciprocity. And um, I think, uh, yeah, anyway, he named them after like planks in the Republican Party platform of the time. So like whatever the Republicans were into in 1884, like one of them was reciprocity, which if I'm remembering correctly, had to do with tariffs. Like if you levy a tariff on us, we're going to levy a tariff on you. And that was one of his planks. So that's what his opossum was called. But I don't know. To me, that just seems like a terrible name for opossum. I, I don't know what a good one is, but that, that one's not it. Um, John Quincy Adams, I, I don't know if you'd call these pets, but his wife collected silkworms and had silkworms at the White House. This was apparently a thing in the 1820s in New England like wealthy women would keep silkworms and then they would use that silk um, to embroider things or, or to make, make stuff. I don't know how you would have enough silkworms to make anything very large. Um, I, you know, maybe an entomologist out there could explain that. I don't know, but um, that's, that's a pretty weird one too. So you get kind of, you get these weird ones. Now I will say, um, you occasionally will hear that Martin Van Buren had tiger cubs or that John Quincy Adams had an alligator given to him by the Marquis de Lafayette. And both of those stories are apocryphal. The alligator, the earliest reference you can find to it is in 1880. Um, I had another historian contact me and ask for sources from the museum and we couldn't find anything earlier than that. And then he got Snopes involved and Snopes couldn't find anything earlier than 1880 either. So it's probable that that never happened. There's a story that Martin Van Buren had a, had tiger cubs given to him, and then Congress made him give the tiger cubs uh, to a zoo. I always liked that because I thought, like, wow, it really shows a time when the executive branch was less powerful and the legislative branch was the more powerful branch. But it's also not true. Um, there had been some uh, lion cubs in Africa that had been given to the U.S. Embassy to be sent to the White House. And while they were awaiting instruction to see what should happen, uh, like, what do you want us to do with these lion cubs? Uh, you know, it took a few months for communication to go back and forth. And in that time, the cubs got bigger and they started tearing things up at the embassy and lion cubs got added to a list of gifts that presidents would not accept. Um, so, you know, you can't give the president a lion now. I, I don't know. Maybe it, maybe you can because, um, I, don't, I don't know, you, you can't indict a sitting president. So what are you going to do if he takes this lion, right? Um, he's just going to have it. But again, I, I do think that good sense would prevail and a lion would be sent to the zoo. I would hope that no president would keep a lion actually in their home. Um, so yeah, those are some, those are some weird animals. Yeah, definitely. I don't think, um, I would want possums or raccoon in my house. Um, so another question that we've got, and I was asking you about this earlier is, 
Can you give the audience um, a little bit of information about how you got involved in working at the Presidential Pet Museum, which many of us have not heard of, as well as, um, you know, that leading you into actually writing a book? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I hadn't heard of the Presidential Pet Museum either before I was contacted by a friend of mine. Uh, what happened was I had been a teacher and I had retired due to my eyesight and I was looking for something to do. And a friend of mine who I'd been in a writing group with uh, called me and said, do you want to get paid to write about presidents and their animals? And I said, well, like money sounds nice. So <clears throat> I found out that she had been working with this guy named Bill Hellman. He's currently the director of the Presidential Pet Museum. Uh, he's also, he calls himself a dog adventurer. He has these huskies and he goes out and like he has them with his bike and they ride around in the forest and do all kinds of things. Um, anyway, uh, Bill asked me to to join the museum and he said, you know, give yourself a title. And I said, oh, I should be historian in residence. I, I picked that because I thought, Wow, that sounds pompous and funny. I never realized that anybody would ever contact me to do anything. <laughs> and so now every time I'm in, in like a newspaper or one of these events, they're like historian in residence. And I feel kind of like a jerk. Um, but that's how I got involved. And it was fascinating from day one to look in and see all of the weird animals that presidents have had. I mean, I had been aware of socks, obviously. I, I knew about Barney Bush and the, the holiday videos that the Bush family put out. Um, when I was little... When I was in fourth grade, I received a copy of Millie's book, As Told to Barbara Bush. It was a book supposedly written by uh, George H.W. Bush's Springer Spaniel, Millie, who had puppies in the White House. Um, Millie's interesting because she was Washingtonian magazine, called her the ugliest dog in Washington, D.C. once in, in a cover story. And um, they eventually uh, wrote an apology letter to Bush and sent some dog biscuits over for Millie. Um, the other thing I like about Millie is that Barbara Bush let it out at one point that Millie showered with the president. So that's kind of hmm. crazy. Like, I, I can't even imagine, like, inviting my Labrador into the shower. It'd just be hair everywhere. And, you know, then he'd smell like wet dog all day. I, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, so I'd read Millie's book when I was a kid, and it felt kind of like foreshadowing. Um, as for the book... Um, we had done a few like self-published children's books, which are also on Amazon. I did one about Old Ike and one about Pushinka. Um, if you have kids that are sort of in between like fourth through sixth grade, it's probably for about that age range. Um, but I, I hadn't really thought much about like trying to go to an actual publishing house to do anything. And after Biden was elected with Major, people were so excited about this rescue dog coming to the White House that Harper Collins contacted the museum and said, hey, does somebody there want to write a book about uh, President Biden and the history of presidential dogs? And I said, yes, because I've always wanted to write a book. And um, it was a really fun experience to go through for the next, uh, you know, took me about a year to do the writing or, or the better part of a year. And then you've got this whole editing process. So going through all of that was really fascinating as somebody who had always wanted to write a book but never had, just to see the inside of the industry. Um, it, it was a lot of fun, although I have to say that right at my deadline, every time there was some kind of deadline, Biden would do something new with the animal. Like um, I hand in the final, manus final manuscript and like the next day, Major gets rehomed for biting people. And I was like, <laughs> oh, so we extend it. And I like write a couple more paragraphs. We change some things. I submit. The next day, they're like, hey, we're getting the cat now. Willow's coming to the White House. So I have to stop and rewrite. Like, ah, curses. Um, but it, it was really fun. It, and it's been a good experience. It, it's gotten me out to a lot of people, places like this, um, where I can talk to people and sort of share my love of history, my love of stories, really. Yeah, you've had some really great stories. So I think we have time for one more um, question, which is going to be a tough one because there are so many good ones. Um, this this one is one of my questions, working at the Filson in the archives and working around collections um, all the time. What is the weirdest artifact or object that you guys actually have at the Presidential Museum? <laughs> okay, so the weirdest one um, goes back to the founder of the museum. Her name was Claire McLean. She was a groomer of Bouvier de Flanders dogs and her mother 
was apparently fairly high up in Republican Party politics. This was the 80s. Reagan was given a dog named Lucky, a Bouvier, and so Claire McLean was brought in to groom Reagan's dog. And apparently there was some little shed or outbuilding on the White House property where the dog would get groomed. And then when they would take the dog away, she would sweep up the hair and take it with her as a souvenir. And she started making mixed uh, mixed media art with this, um, like paintings of Lucky, but with Lucky's hair embedded in the paint. And so we still have one of those paintings, which I think is so strange. Um, like what a what a what an odd thing to do. Um, as far as artifacts artifacts that um, you know we found other places. There's a cowbell that belonged to William Howard Taft's cow Pauline Wayne. That was the last cow to roam the White House grounds. And you might be saying like, why would you have a pet cow? Well, you wouldn't have a pet cow. It was uh, just that they didn't have milk delivery yet in Washington D.C. So if you wanted to have milk. At, at all, um, you basically needed to have a cow around. And so Pauline Wayne would roam the White House grounds and, and um, you know, after Taft, they didn't need that. Then they got milk delivery and then they got better refrigeration and, you know, you didn't have to have it fresh right there. But I, I love that little cowbell too. Um, so the cowbell is one of my favorite artifacts and the weirdest one has got to be the, the lucky dog hair painting. <laughs> so. Yeah, I have to say that is, we have quite a handful of weird things in the Filson collection, but I don't think we have any a mixed media art with animal hair. <laughs> I'll have to ask <laughs> our museum curator about that one. Well, Andrew, we greatly appreciate you coming out tonight. Um, again, this was such a weird coincidence uh, after launching my exhibit, Animals in the Archives, and we were trying to find programming that tied into pets, and your book was one of the first ones that popped up, so we're so glad that we you were able to walk us through your book and tell us a little bit more about uh, presidential pets, and for those in the audience, please make sure to stop by the Filson and check out our Animals in the Archives exhibit. Uh, which is up through February. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you, Heather. And thank you to the Filson Institute. I'm so glad I was able to be here tonight.